The Mayor's First Neighborhood Forum, Summer at the Arboretum, and I Do with Partners for You. All this and more on this week's edition of Lexington Now. I'm Neil Noah and this is Lexington Now for the week of June 10th, 2019. Mayor Linda Gorton recently hosted the first of what are hoped to be many neighborhood summits. We were there to capture a few highlights. My name is Danny Willems. I live in Lexington and have done so for about 11 years and I have lived in the 4th District for 5 of those years. So I came out today because I was really excited to see kind of how our city is moving in terms of engaging our community about different issues that we're all trying to face. So looking at ways that we can build up our neighborhood associations, looking at ways that we can communicate with our city government in more effective manners, looking at ways that we are to addressing the opioid kind of epidemic that we're seeing. I was really excited to kind of come out and see what the city is doing right now and how we're working to teach people about that. Um, my name is Liz Sheehan. I'm a Lexington resident and I live in the 5th Council District. I just love to learn about what's going on in the city. Um, I am an engaged community member, so I like to go and like learn about what's going on, but also get my questions answered, connect with elected officials and city staff, and just be an active community member, I guess. Yeah. So my biggest takeaway from today is probably the fact that Lexington is very eager to learn um, and that our city is ready to teach. Every session I went to today was time for an hour and I think the people in each session probably could have stayed for another 30 minutes each time because they had so many questions and so many things that they wanted to know more about. I was happy with turnout. I'm glad that so many people came and were involved. I was happy with the diversity and the turnout and I was happy at how interactive this was. That it wasn't like a sit and listen kind of thing. You really got to get involved. There were games to be played and some fun to be had. You got your questions answered. So I really enjoyed that engagement piece. I think events like these are incredibly important to the citizens of Lexington and anybody who lives here because A, it's always a good opportunity to engage with your council members, engage with the mayor's office, and just kind of come out and see these people because it's important to realize that our city is made up of other human beings who are just as concerned about these issues as you often are, as someone who lives in this community. And so I think that coming out to a place like this and doing events like this really help to kind of build those communication relationships and help further the conversations that we're all having. I think it's important on a number of levels. So one is just an educational and an awareness component. So making sure that you know what's going on in the city and when you need help or you need a service that you know who to go to to ask for it. Um, another piece is just kind of connecting with elected officials and city staff so that you know who the appropriate person is to ask. Um, and a final piece is just being engaged. So this is a way to be engaged. This is a way to kind of talk to people about your concerns, learn ways that you can make change, um, and to meet people in the community. I would recommend this to any resident in our community from the educational and awareness impact uh, that it could have for your life, but then also um, it is a way for you to find the different ways that you can get engaged. I would highly recommend coming out to an event like this because I do think it's a great opportunity for people to engage with their city government and other partner organizations. Um, I'm looking forward to the city hosting more of these in other locations around town and probably different times, different days, because there's a large segment of our population who I'm sure want to be here and I look forward to the city kind of opening up that table to those people. And I'm going to make sure people know that if our city's making an effort, I hope that you're showing up too, because it's a great event, great opportunity for people to really learn, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next. In spring and summer, the Arboretum is the place to be. We're joined by the Arboretum's own Jackie Gallimore. Jackie, can you tell us what's coming up this summer? 
Okay, sure. Um, so in the Arboretum, as always, the grounds are open from dawn to dusk during the summer, and it's free and open to the public, and we always accept donations too, so there's a donation tube right at the parking lot. And then our only admission garden, the children's garden, is open our summer hours now, so we're open Wednesday through Saturday 10 to 5 and Sunday 1 to 5, and that'll be all the way through August 25th. There's always a daily program in the children's garden any day that we're open three times a day so you can check on our website and see uh, what's happening in the children's garden. Those are always fun and really hands-on recommended for ages three plus. Uh, and then for adults we have lots going on this summer as well. So at the end of June, June 29th, we have a tree ID class that you can take. Uh, we also have our annual run that's happening on June 22nd called the 100 Acre 5k. Um, and then we'll also have, starting at the beginning of June going through October, we'll have uh, mindfulness walks every Thursday from 1210 to 1250. We're going to kick off July with an annual band concert on July 6th and it's at 7 p.m. It's free and it's just a concert that happens out in the Arboretum. So come and bring your picnic blankets and a chair and just enjoy the band concert. We also have our wood turners display and silent auction. So what that is, is wood turners uh, make different pieces from the trees at the Arboretum that have fallen down. And then they put them in the visitor center for display and then you can also bid on them if you want to. Uh, it's a really fun to come see them and also a way to get a really cool artifact. And we also have a couple classes on the art of floral photography. So if you are interested in learning how to take pictures of plants, this will be a good one for you. There's a couple sessions, so check our website for the dates and times. And then if you have kids that you like to bring to the Kentucky Children's Garden, we have our Sizzling Summer event, and that's gonna be July 13th from 10 to one this year. So lots of crafts, lots of organizations that come and do fun stuff with the kids. So, and it's just the same price as general admission. And then we also have our Junior Master Gardener Camp that has a July session and also has an August session. We still have room in the July session though. Um, so there's three main collections at the Arboretum. So the first one is the Walk Across Kentucky. That's considered our signature collection. And it's 80 acres of native plants. So there's a two mile loop that goes through there. And it's really neat to see um, different plants from around Kentucky. And the really cool thing about that is they were all actually wild collected from Kentucky. So our curator went out and collected either um, seedlings or seeds and grew them. And then now they're growing here. So we also have the horticultural gardens and displays, which are more of our showy plants and they, it demonstrates both what you can do at your home, but we also have like a modern rose garden. We have the 5191 Memorial Rose Garden and then we have a fragrance garden. So that's a really good place if you wanna see some really showy blooms. It's plants from all over the world, um, as long as they're non-invasive. And then lastly, we have the Kentucky Children's Garden, which is our only admission garden, but there's lots to do in there. So there's a waiting stream, there's misters, there's a model train. Um, gardening happens every weekend through programming. So there's lots of fun stuff to do, and that's recommended for ages two to six and their families. So a lot of the things that we do at the Arboretum require volunteer help, and we're very grateful for all the volunteers that we do have, but we're always looking for more volunteers. And if you're interested in either working with plants or people or working with kids, we have uh, volunteer opportunities for you. So you can just contact us and, and we will point you in the right direction that meets your needs and ours. When we come back, we talk Partners for Youth in the Summer I Do program. Welcome back to Lexington Now. Summer break has started and so has the challenge of finding ways to keep kids busy. That's where Partners for Youth's Summer I Do program comes in. Brianna personally fills us in. 
Hi, my name is Brianna Persley. I'm the Executive Director of Partners for Youth. Um, Partners for Youth is an agency that is under the LFUCG umbrella, and our office is located at 162 East Main Street, Suite 210. Um, Partners for Youth started back in 1994 after a tragedy, and from that tragedy, Partners for Youth was born. Um, we are a nonprofit agency, and we do many, many things for youth. Our mission is to promote positive youth development and to prevent juvenile delinquency through collaboration and capacity building. We do many things through our I Do initiative, which is a partnership with churches, um, colleges, other organizations throughout the city that come to our community partners table. And we find many creative ways to serve families and their youth and children. So I do is an initiative throughout the city and we have um, community partners tables in Cardinal Valley, Gainesway, and the West End. And I do stands for identifying opportunities, developing relationships, and organizing partnerships. Uh, one of the many things that we do with that is adopt a park. Um, and that is in June, uh, coming up this summer in Valley Park on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 1 to 4 p.m. And then we'll be doing it again in July in the Gainesway Park and Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 4 p.m. And so those are just fun creative ways that we come up with to serve youth and families within those communities. Um, one of the many things that people love about the I Do is our um, I Do summer list. Um, those are free affordable programming throughout the summer um, to serve children and youth. Um, some of those are just a one and done which you'll find on the very back of the pamphlet and others go throughout the summer um, but that's a really really good list to find our community partners send us their information and we compile it into a list that's easy to access um, via internet um, a lot of people will print them off and disperse them throughout their churches or their community organizations um, just to get the word out there about what kids can do as we all know, sometimes kids get into a little trouble during the summer because they just don't have opportunities that are available through them. And that's when the I Do List uh, was developed so that we can make sure to disseminate that information throughout the city. Within the I Do List, you also find different camps throughout the city. Um, we have over 70 in there this year, which is pretty great. You know, there's lots of opportunities um, that are a mix of things. They offer anywhere from art, to music lessons, to recreation, uh, to tutoring, some equine programs. So you're going to find a plethora of opportunities throughout the city for the summer. So we newly released our 2019 Grassroots Grants Allocations Programs. Um, Partners for Youth is a clearinghouse for funds and we offer anywhere from $750 to $3,000 in a grant form to people that want to provide positive youth programming throughout the city. This year we have uh, announced that we have uh, offered or sponsoring 26 programs this year and that list is also available for you to find on our Facebook page, our website, and also uh, just it's announced on Instagram. But we like to make sure that we are able to shout those out as well. Some of them are offered in the summer um, only and some are offered in the summer uh, during the fall semester and also during winter break and or January. And so those are good programs that kids can also be involved in. Some are specific to an area and some are citywide. So we always encourage people to check those out as well. The Better Business Bureau has been a resource for consumers for over a century. We spoke to Heather Clary about the Bureau and ways you can help protect yourself from scams. We're happy to be able to be here to assist people when they call trying to check out a business or a charity or perhaps they want to report a scam or perhaps they were scammed and they need advice and that's what we're here for to try to help people mitigate that and avoid it and keep it from happening again in the future. The Better Business Bureau is a private nonprofit business organization. We are not a government agency. It started back in 1912 when some businessmen got together and formed advertising vigilance committees and that later became the Better Business Bureau system with over 100 offices throughout North America and in Canada and including one office in Mexico. 
Know that the Better Business Bureau is not just there for the consumer, but we're there to help the business as well. There are scams aimed at businesses, and if you would like to become a part of our Better Business Bureau and help support ethics in the marketplace and keep the con artists out and keep all of our money in to keep our economy strong, and you'd like to see how the Better Business Bureau can help your business, give us a call and we can certainly see if you qualify to become BBB accredited and be happy to have you to help us continue our mission of advocating for an ethical marketplace. A lot of the scams we hear about here at the BBB take place over the phone or over the internet. Going really strong right now are phone scams where the perpetrators claim to be with various governmental agencies, Medicare, IRS, Social Security, uh, even court officials or the sheriff's department. And what we want to let people know is that these government agencies are never going to call you unsolicited. If there's a problem or they need to reach out to you, they're usually going to write a letter. However, these perpetrators are using scare tactics to get the public to return these calls and part with personal information or even money and people have lost money to these scams because they're threatened with things like you're going to lose your social security benefits or you're going to be arrested unless you pay these back taxes you owe or a jury duty summons you missed they'll make up any story to sound very very credible and unfortunately some people do fall for it we want people to know that if they get a call like that and they're not sure if it's the real deal or not give us a call we deal with these every day and we are here to help you determine the real calls from the fake calls and to try to avoid the scams altogether. We want to warn people that it's door-to-door -door time. Uh, many contractors that are from out of town, they come around in unmarked trucks, they try to tell you they have leftover materials in their trucks and can pave that driveway or paint your barn, uh, fix your gutters. They have no credentials, no insurance, no proof of anything. People have hired them, given them money, got shoddy work, if any work at all, and then had to pay more money to get somebody to come back and do it right. So avoid the headache. Use your BBB. We can help hook you up with businesses that you can trust to take care of those jobs. By the same token, we want to hear about any suspicious things going on in your neighborhood, people going door to door, offering services, you don't know who they are, uh, using some scare tactics, high pressure, things of that nature. And you'll also want to ask and be sure that these folks are registered with the Division of Building Inspection under the Contractor Registration Ordinance because that is a local law that's required for anybody doing work like this in Fayette County. You can use our website at bbb.org to search for a listing of BBB accredited businesses that meet all of our standards and have been invited to join the Better Business Bureau that you can get estimates from in order to have whatever job it is you need done by someone you trust. Not all businesses qualify to join the Better Business Bureau and if they are in the BBB, one of the requirements is that they make a promise to respond to any customer complaints if something can't be resolved between the two of them. And the BBB acts as a neutral third party to help the consumer and the business try to work out any problems that have arisen through our complaint processing and mediation and arbitration in some instances. If you're not very comfortable with a computer, you can also receive lists of BBB accredited businesses right here in our Better Business Bureau accredited business directory. It has our 2,000 BBB accredited businesses listed in it by category so that you can search for someone to give you estimates on whatever job you need. And not just house repairs, anything from banks to dry cleaners to folks to fix your car, mow your lawn, uh, anything you can think of. And that's available for free. If you give us a call, we'll be happy to mail you one. And again, you can also look at bbb.org and hunt up names of businesses, see what kind of record it has, if they've had any complaints, and if so, did they resolve it? You can read customer reviews. You can submit customer reviews. If you had a good experience with a business, why not get on and let the world know about it and submit a BBB customer review? I'm sure the businesses would be happy and other folks can see about your experience too. Our staff is available by phone Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 by calling 259-1008. Simply push zero during the opening message during our office hours to speak with a live operator or you can use the automated system to hear information about businesses in the after hours times. Also get on our website at bbb.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and we're also on Twitter. 
Here's Chris Edwards with this week's Lex TV meeting schedule. Chris? Thanks, Neil. As we told everyone last week, there are a lot of meetings this week that can be seen live here on Lex TV and streamed on the city's website. On Tuesday, June 11th at 1 p.m. will be the Council's General Government and Social Services Committee meeting. This week, there will be no formal presentations given to the Council during this committee meeting. At 3 p.m. on Tuesday will be the Council's work session. The new business portion of the work session is relatively short. However, there is one really interesting piece of legislation to take note of. Item G in the new business is authorizing an agreement with the LFUCG, City Center, and ATS Construction for the reconstruction of South Upper Street between West Vine and Main Street. This is one of those roads that's had one lane closed since the construction began at City Center. Hopefully, this is signifying the end of lane closures around City Center's construction. Then on Wednesday, June 11th at 9 a.m. is the Police and Fire Pension Board meeting. Later on Wednesday at 5 p.m. is the Board of Architectural Review. Finishing up the week on Thursday, June 13th is the Planning Commission meeting. This week's topics will be about subdivision items. That's all we have for this week's meeting schedule. Remember, you can see these meetings live here on Lex TV and WebStream at the city's website at lexingtonky.gov. Neil, back to you. Thanks, Chris. And that will do it for this week. You can keep up with us on social media and check out the latest traffic updates on Twitter at LexRex or catch our live traffic cams on LexingtonKY.gov. For the staff and producers at LexTV, I'm Neil Noah, and that's it for now.